Hello guys, welcome back to Remove Before Race and today I want to talk to you about a Lamborghini tractor. No, not, not that one. I'm talking about the original Lamborghini. So back in the day there was a very successful tractor company called Lamborghini Trattori and it was run by Ferruccio Lamborghini who was a very successful businessman thanks to that company. Now Ferruccio, like many successful businessmen, also had a passion for cars. He was also a bit of an engineer and he owned a Ferrari 250 GT, among other cars. Now he kept having problems with the clutch on his Ferrari and eventually ended up complaining to the man himself, Enzo Ferrari. Now at this fateful meeting was born a rivalry that still burns today. And it was at the fateful moment that Enzo said to Ferruccio, it's not the car, it's the driver, stick to your tractors. Oh dear, and it was that challenge apparently made to Ferruccio that set a fire under him. So, what did he do? He decided to set up a little factory in Santa Garta, and along with some ex-Ferrari employees, they set out to build a 150 mile hour Super GT, and they did. They built the Lamborghini 350 GT, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I mentioned this just to give you a bit of an idea of Lamborghini's original origins and how it wasn't all just supercars back then. But then later on, Lamborghini took a, a massive detour and decided to bid for a military contract. And they did it with this, the Cheetah. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's a Hummer because it took major inspiration from American trucks at the time. Some say a bit more than inspiration. So this featured a Chevy V8 in the rear, so it was actually a rear mounted engine. And because of that, it handled like absolute crap. And the car was eventually not taken up for the military contract either. So when Lamborghini was bought out in the mid eighties, this project wasn't completely abandoned. Instead, the new owners took all the money that was poured into that and decided to redo the product from the ground up. And they changed the engine layout from rear to a front mounted V12 out of the Countach of that time, which was one of the most awesome supercars of all time. So we had a V12 in the front, 450 brake horsepower, and it cost about the same as a Countach S back then. So this was a serious, serious thing in terms of figures, not only in terms of performance for an SUV, but price as well. And because of that, of course, it attracted wealthy individuals, including Sly Stallone. And eventually that's why the car garnered the nickname, the Rambo Lambo. Now this was not the most successful project for Lamborghini. They only sold about 300 of them total. And then it folded away and we never heard about a Lambo SUV again until about 2012, where in Beijing we saw the Lambo Urus concept. But before that, we actually saw something else. Now the Urus concept was made to satiate Lamborghini customers who wanted more of a daily car to go alongside their two-seater, naturally aspirated, howling supercar. So before the Urus concept, we had something that was perhaps a little less controversial, and that was the concept Estoc A. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. Now that was, of course, a super saloon. And I do wonder, with the kind of negative reaction that some people give the Urus for being an SUV Lamborghini, whether this would have had more of a positive reaction. I feel it would have because generally us petrol heads seem to prefer performance saloons over performance SUVs. In fact, even if you took the Eurus's design and kind of squished it down into a little saloon, I think it actually looks pretty damn cool. Or certainly it would still be a little better received. But you see, the thing is SUVs have changed in recent years. Now car manufacturers, especially the top end performance manufacturers, know how to manage heavy cars a lot better. So you look at cars now like the AMG GLC 63S, the Stelvio Quadrifoglio, even the upcoming AMG GT four door, all pretty big and heavy cars. Two of them are SUVs. One is a super saloon but now they know how to manage the weight, they know how to make it handle really well. So no longer are SUVs thought of as just off-roading cars, now they are legitimately performance cars. So what do you think? Do you think Ferruccio would be turning in his grave? I don't think so. I mean, the man built tractors. 
If anything, I think he'd be happy that Lamborghini got one over Ferrari on making the first super SUV. But now let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the Urus. First of all, the name. Your anus. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I needed to just get that out of my system. And I know all of you guys are probably saying it at the same time, but that's enough potty humor, kids. Let's, let's get down to business. This Urus has very kindly been lent to us at Remove Before Race by Aleem, who you guys will better know as Lord Aleem from Instagram. Now Lamborghini in and of itself is not a massive company. It's actually quite small, but they are part of the VAR group. So they have the luxury of picking and choosing the components that they want to suit their needs. And we've seen that with the Hurricane and the R8 sharing so much. And much of the same is true with the Urus, perhaps to a fault, but I'll let you guys decide that later. So the actual platform itself is shared with the Audi Q7 and Q8. The engine, the four litre V8 twin turbo is also from Audi. Unfortunately, we don't get the howling V10 or V12 from the supercars because you need torque in a four x four. Not to say you can attach twin turbos to a V12, but I digress. It's also got a gearbox from Porsche. We've got the suspension and rear axle from the Bentley Bentayga and it's got rear wheel steering and other components all that come together from these different companies, but then they've been switched around and changed and modified by Lamborghini and shoved into this, the Urus. But no other SUV in the group has all of these bits come together and they certainly do not have a 650 brake horsepower engine with 850 Newton meters of torque that can do zero to 60 in 3.6 seconds. So this, on paper, could be a serious, serious machine. But before we can explore any of that and how it all comes together in the actual drive of the car, we have to address the design. Now this is a very Marmite thing and you didn't need me to tell you that because you already know from the car's infamy. So what do you think of the design? I've noticed some really interesting things, but Let's first break it down to bare basics. You have, of course, got the signature Lamborghini look as far as the bonnet and the lights go. So we can all agree that looks right. It looks like a Lamborghini. But then you've got a really large front intake and it's needed, of course, to cool the engine because the engine's in the front, unlike the supercars. You can't have a small nose SUV. It's just not possible. But then when you start to look at the details on the front, and you start exploring all the rest of the car, I notice certain patterns or certain geometrical shapes that were being replicated absolutely everywhere. One was a hexagon and one was a Y-shaped design. And as I looked around the car, I started seeing it in every single area. And then you start to see the attention to detail that's been given to the design of the Urus, whether you like the finished product or not you have to admire how far they went using these geometrical shapes. Let me show you where I found them. I mean, they're absolutely everywhere. You look at the front, you've got the hexagons, you've got the Y shape, we come to the headlights, we've got the Y shape on the side there. Again, even the little textures, rather than just leaving them blank, they've been made using those shapes. As you come around the side, even the side profile of the car has that Y shape. And then I noticed the wheel arches are also a half hexagon, but the wheel arches also look very, very similar to the ones that we saw in the LM02. But so does the little vent above the front wheel arch. So you're seeing some connection a little bit to that original SUV. The running board also has that within the rubber of the mats, the light beam within the rear light, and of course the front light as we saw, and again, the textures of that Y shape flowing through that. Even the 22 inches on this car have that Y spoke design. I mean, the attention to detail and the obsession over these shapes, I've never seen it in a car design before. I mean, it's just obsessive. It's a shame that then when you look at the wing mirrors, they're actually the exact same as the Audi Q8. And it's just little things like that, that let it down. But overall, it's quite interesting. I actually like the rear probably the most. So let's have a look at that now. There's two spoilers here. One is the obvious one, but there's one at the top of the rear windshield as well, which is very, very Lamborghini. I like the look of it and it 
gives the roof line a really cool look. The whole light strip with the Lamborghini logo, this entire rear end part screams Lamborghini to me. You've got these air vents in the side, again, very sporty looking. The pipes are almost identical to what you'll find on a Huracan. I like how Aleem has made his rear diffuser black as well. It's much better than the standard chrome one that you get on the car. Overall, it looks very, very Lamborghini from the rear. But then there are some really awkward shapes and awkward views to this car, and I want to show you some of them now. And in that sense, the design can be awkward in some areas. We've also got the Lamborghini Carbon Ceramici, Carbon Ceramic Brakes. They're the biggest to be fitted on any production vehicle in the world with a size of 440 millimeters on the front and 370 millimeters on the rear. They are absolutely gigantic. Then you've got the roof line. Don't know what you guys think about that. Of course, it's very slopey, all very angular. In fact, the whole side is angular. And if I hadn't shown you the specific shapes within the design, you'd be forgiven for comparing it with a Lexus SUV, as I've done jokingly many times in my stories on Instagram and I apologize for that, I'm a bit of a child. But the overall effect then, it is Marmite, but I wonder what a Lamborghini customer thinks of it as opposed to someone else from outside of the brand. But one thing I said to a lot of people was, what if Lamborghini based their Super SUV on the LMO2? What if it was like a modern version, kind of like Mercedes AMG keep doing with the G-Wagon? I mean, it could look quite interesting with some modern design elements from Lamborghini and whatnot. But then I realized the LMO2 isn't exactly an icon of the auto industry, and nor did it sell particularly well that Lamborghini should have to hinder themselves in terms of aerodynamic design. And then it wouldn't really be a super SUV, would it? It would be more like the G-Wagon, a really nice looking retro fast SUV that really wouldn't do that well in terms of handling and whatnot. So they went for the supercar look instead, which is, is more understandable considering their goal is super SUV. That wouldn't have worked. And I was wrong about that, so I'll put my hands up because I did keep saying that. But then I think a lot of the look of the Urus depends on how you spec it. So Aleem has gone for full blacked out with the running boards, which looks really good from certain angles. But then from the side profile, it's quite bulky because it's all one look. Whereas if you've got a color like something more vibrant, like, like the uh, Giallo, it looks shorter in the middle because there's that much more contrast between the black side sill and the yellow part of the body. Then you've got a black bit of the mouth and it all looks a bit more Lamborghini to me. Not to say that this doesn't because this reminds me so much from the front and rear of the Huracan that I had, but yeah, I think it depends what look you're going for. This is certainly a lot more SUV. If you go for the brighter colors, it looks a bit more Lamborghini. I think we'd be remiss not to compare it to Aventador as well, just to see what it looks like in comparison. I think there's quite a bit similar. I do wonder whether we'll see more of that kind of design when further models of the Urus come out. I mean, let's not forget when the Cayenne first came out, it was a very ugly looking VW and eventually it's matured into a beautiful SUV. Perhaps this has started off a little bit better and will get even better as time goes on, I'm hopeful. But enough about the outside, let's jump inside and see how much of it is Lamborghini. First of all, let's commend Aleem on his spec choice because as you know, I absolutely hate getting black interiors on the channel. At least we've got something half exciting here. We've got leather and red Alcantara um, so it all looks rather quite good. So it's a good starting point for us to analyze this interior. And I want to do that straight off the bat. So let's compare it first to Huracan. I think there's a lot that you can see here that matches that. You've got a very strong middle center console. Of course, we've got the mission control, uh, missile launching rather, start button. The vents are very much in the same position of the Huracan, same style. Um, but then that's when things start to move away. And if you have driven any modern Audi cars, you'll start to see a lot of similarities with those. Namely, if we fire this up with the lovely button, little things like this, really important. I really like 
that that stayed in there and it wasn't some other way of turning the car on like a like turning the key uh if you've seen the recent q8 or a8 these screens are literally just pulled out of there slightly reskinned you have got the hexagonal texture within the software as well so it's a bit of lamborghini going on in there as well now if you like the a8 system that's great uh, if you're not a fan of it like i'm not i just don't like touch screen systems not systems that are touch screen only i feel you need to have some kind of control unit to control things because doing this and looking there when you're driving is just not ideal and it's not safe um, and touch screens are i think when a car is moving around and this car's suspension as you'll see later is very sports car like then to aim and hit buttons it's not ideal and then if you'd like if i go into navigation and i want to type in a destination either i use this keyboard or i have to start squiggling letters on here again i don't find that safe and then that continues to the front here but before i show you that i just want to compare this directly to the q8 and when you look at the q8's interior everything looks very similar to the urus but it just looks like a, a much more down market version of the urus interior the urus looks very lamborghini until you get to the driver zone. Now this really bothers me because the driver zone to me is always the most important part of a car's interior. You've seen when I've done my other reviews, I've praised certain cars for having really cool driver zones. This one, it looks really good unless again, you sat in a modern Audi, in which case you'll see the A8's digital screen. And most annoyingly, the screen I'm not too bothered about because it's a good screen. All the fonts in fact, but it's the steering wheel, because this steering wheel, you'll notice from the buttons, and I noticed immediately, are, again, out of your modern Audis, and even the shape of the steering wheel. There are some unique Lamborghini bits, so we've got this lower metal part with the Italian flag, the actual airbag itself, and there's a lovely, lovely detail of a metal ring at the 12 o'clock position, and it looks nice that part but the rest of it it's all audi and the paddle shifters where you whereas you've got the massive ones in the hurricane and the aventador these are like miniaturized versions of those still better than having just standard ones for sure and i do like the metallic feel and in practice they work and feel really nice so it's a bit of a mixed bag but my favorite bit is actually this it's called a tamburo which roughly translates to drum and this controls all the performance related parts of the car. So I wanna show you some of this now. On the left-hand side, we've got ANIMA, which stands for Adaptive Network Intelligent Management System, but forget that. What it basically does is control your performance driving modes. So at the top, we've got Strada or Comfort, then you've got Sport, Corsa, and then if you get the off-roading package, you get three more. Well done, Lean, for getting that, because even though we're probably not gonna use it, it's bragging rights that we've got three more driving modes. And there we've got Sabia for sand, Terra for gravel or other terrain, and Neve for snow. So this car, in theory, is able to handle all of that. We're not going to be doing any of that on this review because we're more about the daily driving and the performance. Then in the middle, of course, you've got your start-stop button, absolutely crucial in a Lamborghini. And you've got your park, manual. There's no drive, though, which is brilliant. Your reverse is here. You give a nice pull like a Starship Enterprise engage but to get into drive just like the Huracan and the Aventador you have to click the paddle and I love that it's little things like that are really important especially if you're going to call this thing a super SUV it's the small things that you do every day that need to click then on this side we've got Ego now Ego is basically setting up the car's performance yourself so how the gearbox reacts the suspension and the steering you can put it into Ego mode and for example have everything on sport apart from the suspension, which is a nice way to drive. But as I start to look at the interior, just as I saw outside, you start seeing those geometric shapes everywhere. And I love this because it means that a lot of time has been taken to look at the design. So even the cup holders, they've got that particular shape and the parking controls next to that. The thing that houses the screen is in a hexagon. The air vents are hexagons. The stitching on the seats are hexagons then the Bang & Olufsen speaker covers have the Y design on them. So you get all these lovely details, and then you hear this sound. Yeah, that's that Audi sound. 
Why a simple sound file could not be replaced with something else, I just don't understand. It's just little things like that that pull me out of the experience. But then there are some lovely details inside. Allow me to show you some of those now. Especially things like the door handles here are lovely. They're, they're very Lamborghini. And I do like the gap behind the center console as well. And of course you've got Lamborghini written here as you would in the other cars. So there's a lot that keeps you in this thinking it is a Lamborghini. One of my favorite bits is the modes, the driving select modes, how they change when you cycle through them. And when you get to Corsa, you get one very similar to the Aventador as well. So these are all plus points. I hate though how you have to kind of cycle through all of these to get back. For example, if I went to Comfort to Sport, to get back to Comfort, I've got to go all the way down and then come back to Comfort rather than just push up. Weird. Um, one final note on the design, I just want to show you what this looks like compared to the LMO2, because I think there are some similarities there. So it's a mixed one. There's Audi bits here and there if you know to look for them, and the majority of it, structure-wise, looks very Lamborghini, looks very much like the Urus concept as well. So really, I'll leave that for you guys to decide. For me, the most annoying thing is the steering wheel and I apologize if I keep ranting on about that later on in the review as well. In terms of the rear space, it's really good. There's lots of space in the rear. I'm not gonna bother sitting in there because there is genuinely loads of space. It is a big SUV and it's got big space. The boot space is massive as well. You've got lovely detailing in terms of the Lamborghini logo on the headrests and it all looks like the rear seats of a Lamborghini really should. But now, as with every performance car we test, it's important to see what it sounds like. So let's start it up in Strada and see what it sounds like. That was a very powerful startup and it is seriously, seriously loud. There's that thing Audi sound again. When you start up in cold start, it is very, very loud indeed. Really reminded me of the Hurricane. That, not so much so. But let's give it some revs. Let's go all the way back to Strada. And then when you go into Corsa, you can hear the flaps open. There is no exhaust button, so you can't do that manually. one of the loudest things I've had revving in this driveway. That sounds really, really good, I think. But I really want to see what it sounds like on the road. Revving here isn't going to prove anything and neither is, neither is talking about the spec. So let's get going. Let's see what this big, fast, super SUV can do on some more challenging roads. For any of you keeping score, I'm now taking the matching of the clothes to the car to the next level. So we've got leather and cloth here and leather and cloth here. I'm no longer sitting on the seat, now I am the seat. So I think the bit I feel immediately is that 850 Newton meters of torque. When the power opens, it's like a dam is burst and this reservoir of water just kind of flows in. That's how it feels like. It's like an endless supply of power. And that's what you want a heavy torque figure to feel like in a car like this. I'm taking this bend like 90 miles per hour, it's doing it with ease. I can't seem to find a speed or a gear where it just doesn't pick up speed maniacally like I'm doing 85 now. Loads of power in there. And that is something that is relatable immediately to Huracout. And then you go into Corsa, you see the HUD change, you see the screen in front change, and everything about the car changes at the same time. And it's even louder than the way the body feels change as well. It, it gets even stiffer. It controls the body roll even more. And now that reservoir of power is completely on demand. The only thing that kind of lets it down are sometimes 
laggy gear response, especially going downwards, which is something I normally wouldn't associate with a Lamborghini because the Hurricane's ones, the Hurricane's gearbox is very, very responsive. So I think the eight speed in this is a bit of a letdown. As I said, I really can't discern any kind of engine lag in this, the most excitable setup, and certainly in sport as well. Now, stopping power, stopping power is very good as well, and that's quite important for a car like this. It needs to have good stopping power because you've got that much power, and it's scary power as a driver, even someone who's used to fast cars because it's a 2.2 ton thing near on. Now, the 0 to 60 is meant to be 3.6 seconds. I don't doubt it for a second. But let's see if launch control is easy to do in this car. Well, that's what I meant about the jolt. That was very quick. Now, let's talk about the sound now. So I'm starting off in Strada, which is comfort, as we mentioned. So as you can see, it doesn't sound like much at the moment on the run. So let's actually put it first into the next notch up, which is sport mode on the anima. And immediately you get big decibels of sound, immediate engine response. So this is the midpoint. And as we saw, it gets louder in course, and no doubt it gets a bit more energetic as well. Oh, oh. oh. Butterflies. And this is, I think immediately you feel the, the Lamborghini side to this tune, where it doesn't feel like the Audi or the Porsche variants of this engine. Um, it's a really sweet engine, actually. So the decibels are quite high in the revs, as you can probably hear, which is nice. Okay, it's not hurricane loud, but the revs kind of build and sound in a very familiar kind of way to me, at least, as a, as a previous hurricane owner. So the crackles you get on the overruns. They're not that loud. They're nothing as loud as the AMG V8, uh, in the, like in my GLC 63S. The revs are louder than that, a lot louder. But the actual pops and the bangs and the crackles are, are not, they don't have the decibel that the AMG engine does. Which is kind of strange because this is meant to be a super SUV compared to those, which is just your normal sports SUV. So, but I do think the revs, the sound of them really make up for it. And then as we had it earlier, put it into Corsa, and it gets even louder. I think the bang at the end, when the gear change is a bit louder in Corsa. Compared to Hurricane, I think the revs sound really quite similar, but nowhere near as screamy as that car. That's, of course, got that lovely V10 in it. Uh, but this has got kind of its own tune. It's not like the other VAR Group cars. It's, it's not like the Huracan, but it's got kind of its own song, which is not a displeasing one. Listen to that. It sounds good. It sounds powerful. One thing that's very frustrating, as I also found in the Giulia Quadrifoglio, is that there's no exhaust button. So if you want the, the valves to open, you actually need to put it into Corsa or in Sport. And of course, everything else changes then as well. It's just a button anywhere would have been good. And we've taken so much from VAR Group in this car. Why not just have an exhaust button like a Cayenne does as well? But I do like the sound, it is addictive. When you pair that with the immense torque you get, it's a really addictive combination. And then of course you've got infinite grip from this four wheel drive system, so it is really, really fun. Compared to something like the GLC or the Stelvio Quadrifoglio, the sound does make this seem like a super SUV, even if the bangs and whatnot aren't as loud. But I think where this might come unhinged is when something like the new GLE 63S comes out with the engine tune of the E63. That's gonna have revs that probably sound very similar to this, because this sounds a lot like the E to me. And then it'll have the louder pops and bangs. So uh, it's a tough one then, because this, that car will be so much closer to this, certainly in terms of sound. Now I wanna to talk to you about handling and I'm gonna keep it in course over this. Handling is the thing that I really like and I really dislike in this car. 
Uh, it's a bit of an odd statement to make, but I will qualify it and you will understand. So I'm going to start with steering. I don't like the steering in this car because it does not feel very natural. You have not got enough feedback coming through the wheel. I'm not sure where the front wheels are and it doesn't give you the confidence of just knowing where the front end is going and you pair that with the lack of kind of visibility that you have here in the front as well and it's a bit terrifying in a car that can go so fast. I'd really want more feedback coming through the steering wheel than this. When you compare it to something like the GLC 63S in a much cheaper car but that feels so much more nimble and agile just because of the steering but then in this car the great equalizer and the bit that I love is the rear wheel steering I absolutely love the rear wheel steer it's some of my favorite technologies that come into cars lately this one's got a three degree angle on the rear and just like in my AMG GTR it shortens the wheelbase when you're doing smaller maneuvers so parking in and around town but when you're taking corners like this it corners so well it feels magical in such a big car. It's just frustrating that as a super SUV, I mean, did it have to be this big? It, it could have been a supercar still as a smaller SUV, maybe as the Stelvio and the GLC, just, just more powerful. Because this feels fat compared to those. The car's got active body roll stabilization, so it doesn't keep the car as flat as I'd heard the Urus was. It actually does give you a bit of feeling as to how the body is moving. And it's quite nice, especially when you start taking on much more exaggerated corners. It is at that point when the Urus really surprises you, when it starts behaving like a sports car, and you're like, what, there is no way something this big can turn like this does, but it actually does. It's really, really surprising. And I think that's what's addictive about the Urus, and it's where most of us are gonna underestimate the car and then realize, no, it has got some serious handling ability. This thing would really knock spots off an Audi RS6 Avant. And that's how I want you to remember this, if anyone ever asks you about the handling. Everything looks, feels, and sounds so Lamborghini, but I just get pulled out of the experience whenever I see this steering wheel. All those navigation displays, they just really irk me in this. Now if we head back into Comfort or Strada, which I've got to now go through all the gears, Sabia, Terra, Neve, and Strada, there we go. Mm, yes, as you can tell, I don't like doing that. So I want to talk a bit about the daily driving. Um, I'm currently doing the silly stuff that I've been doing, averaging at 12 MPG, which is pretty much expected. But I did a long drive of this when I collected it from Pet HQ in Birmingham back to London and I got about 27 mpg, which is pretty damn good on a long journey for a 650 brake horsepower super SUV. But in and around town, I've been finding that I'm getting no more than sort of 15, 16, because this is the kind of car, again, that you really do want to drive fast. You don't want it to be in Strada. You much rather pop it into sport, open the valves up a little bit, and when you get a chance, do some silly things because the car just responds so well to it. I just love how this car handles. <laughs> I hate myself for loving how it handles, actually. It, it just feels so wrong, like I'm committing some grave sin in the petrol head world. The suspension's a bit of a mixed bag for daily driving. I kind of like it because I like the way that supercars and sports cars feel. So you feel every bump in the road. Uh, which is unpleasant for a lot of people. I kind of like it, but it does make the daily driving aspect, when you're talking about families or what, and whatnot, a little bit cumbersome. Um, it does really seem to feel a lot of the bulbs, bumps and jolts. Even on the motorway, it seems to unhinge the car a little bit because it seems to be riding so flat on the road. But doing that long journey from Birmingham to London, was really quite pleasant, it just chewed up miles. It felt, dare I say, more like an Audi SUV, um, which is not a bad thing because Audi are one of the top luxury car makers in the world. So if you're gonna base a daily luxury or half luxury car on something, it might as well 
have a decent VAR group base, and it does, and it feels like you can do miles and miles and miles and miles, and this car has done miles. I'm in comfort, and I do take issue with the sound on a daily basis, because at the moment, I'd like the flaps open just driving around, because I want to know that I'm in a Lamborghini, but I can't. I have to then go into Sport or Corsa. And if I go around town in third or second gear, which is what the automatic mode wants me to do, or I have to put it into manual, I'm going to look like an absolute moron. All it needed was just a butt. I'm going to hammer on about that until they put it in the facelift. It's a tough one to give a verdict on this car because I know who it's built for, and you guys know who it's built for as well. It's built for someone who's either had a Lamborghini and wants a daily car, or has a Lamborghini and wants a daily car, or understands what a Lamborghini means and has not been able to get one because they needed more practicality. So there's a very, very specific customer for that. You cannot make the argument that someone who might want a Q8 or a Q7 or a Cayenne Turbo or whatnot would come to look at this car. I don't think that's what the market is for it. For Lamborghini, there is a very specific purpose, making more units, giving their customers a daily car that is practical, and then shoving what is going to be a very profitable car, I'm sure, all shoving all those profits into future products to make them even better. Whether that is justification for making a car, I'm not convinced, but to serve their customers' purposes for having a daily, you can't really question someone's choice. I personally, if I was gonna spend 200 grand, I wouldn't personally buy this car. I'd go get a Stelvio Quadrifoglio and a C63 and an A35, and that'll spend that same amount of money. But the customer who wants this isn't even considering that, because you can make the same argument about a Huracan. Indeed, when there is a RS version of the Q8, you're gonna have that scenario where you've got an RS Q8 and you've got this, the Urus, both probably using very similar technologies, just like you have with the R8 and the Huracan. But that doesn't mean that the Urus won't sell. It will absolutely sell because, again, that's not the point of this car. The point is that it is a Lamborghini. There's so much Lamborghini flavor in this car. First of all, it's just really easy to drive. It's replicatable, safe fun as you'd find in the Huracan. It's something that people take the piss out of Lambo owners for. But this is doing that. Whether you like that or not, it's replicatable. It's extremely fun whenever you drive fast. This is a niche that's not going away anytime soon. This is a, already a successful selling car. And of course, we just heard news, if you haven't heard, that Ferrari are also going to be doing a super SUV. I think it's called a Puro Songway. Uh, feel free to correct me in the comments. So unfortunately, these cars are just here. And I say unfortunately because I personally don't like them. One thing I can't take away from the car, despite how I feel about it, is how well it goes about what it does. And I think I kind of respect it because of that, because it can handle really well. Yes, I would love steering that has more feedback, and that's something to work on for Lamborghini in the future. But the way this picks up speed, the quality of the sound despite being a turbo engine, the way the car just seems to handle its weight and defy physics is exactly what I was hoping this car would do. I'm fascinated to see what a slightly more performance orientated model of this would be like and if there's ever like an SV version of it as well. Um, I think this is a really good base to start with as a, as a first hurrah. So guys, thank you so much for watching this video on the Lamborghini Urus. More than ever, I want to hear your comments in the comment section about this car. I've struggled coming to a definite conclusion because there is no definite conclusion to be fair on any car. It's such a subjective thing. All we can really measure is real world ability so as you always do, please do like and subscribe and share this video. And as I always do, I'm going to launch off into the sunset.